Today's video has excitement, sweat, and excess calories. No, Jen and I are not doing a what we eat in a day video in the style of a nine and a half weeks remake. No, I'm riding my new motorbike to a park run, and if fast enough, will reward myself with a donut. Okay, let's start with the bike. This is a BMW R1250 GS Adventure. I can't stand them, I hate them. Um, not this one, obviously that's mine, that's fine. But all the others, I have never liked them. The one I used on my off-road training skills day, that was cool, but yeah, just not my thing. Jen had one, GS850, that was okay. If I was sat on one, it's okay. All the others, I hate them. I'll elaborate on my problem with these bikes in a moment, but in a nutshell, the things are just everywhere. BMW sell a zillion of them every year and have done ever since Obi-Wan Kenobi and that little kid from the Emerald Forest rode them around the world after a marketing genius at KTM refused to let them use their bikes instead. Where did you learn your trade? But nobody else is riding these things around the world. They're bought by middle-aged blokes who use them to pop out on a Sunday and meet other middle-aged blokes at cafes where they just drink lattes and sit around in their matching adventure clothing, all wearing those stupid flip-up lids. I just don't get it. Okay, half eight, park run to get to. Let's go. So at 17 years old, I wanted a Kawasaki AR125 because I thought it was the closest thing I'm ever going to get to owning what I really wanted, a GPZ900R. But my mum said it looked far too dangerous, I needed to be sat upright to see where I was going. Ended up with a Yamaha DT125. Once I passed my test though, I decided to get a CBR600, no more sitting upright. But here's a tip, if you buy the jacket to match the bike and then discover you can't afford to insure the bike, and so have to end up buying a different bike that's doing a deal on free insurance, 30 years later, you might be explaining why you're now wearing a CBR600 jacket sat on a Yamaha Super Tenere, sat upright. After a couple of years of that, I was able to get myself onto a ZZR600 and told myself I would never need to sit upright again, then I sold that and got fat. And now ignoring a couple of years in the late 90s where I bought an R1 and did track days to remind myself that I was still cool and exciting and unencumbered by everyday life, despite being none of that, I didn't know motorcycling until 2016. Then, two years after meeting Jen, she wanted to go and travel in Peru without me, just her and her best friend. I said, fine, maybe I'll travel around Namibia on a motorbike all alone. Didn't know where that was. Sounded scary. Plan was, she'd say, that's crazy and dangerous. Why don't we go to Peru together? So a few weeks later, she's in Machu Picchu and I'm terrified and alone in Africa. And so here is where my relationship with big fat adventure bikes got a bit of a tweak. I went from thinking they were just dumb things that your mum made you ride, to realising they were actually very, very good, but in the right place. A week before I'd gone to Africa, I'd done that off-road skills course. First time on a bike in 15 years, and first time ever on a BMW GS, and by the end of it, I was throwing it around like a dirt bike and staggered at how good it was at what it was good at. Then in Namibia, the Super 10 I rode was the same. For something to fly over gravel or sand-covered road, lugging gear, in comfort, there is no better type of bike. I liked it so much, Jen did a test, we went back together. Big adventure bikes on big adventures, amazing. We then bought some medium-sized bikes and did some trickier stuff in Europe, riding over the Pyrenees. But on all those trips, we saw two sides to the adventure bike world. Our side, dust and dirt and danger and excitement and adventure. And then we'd ride into town, out of the African desert, or come down off the mountains to a little Spanish village. And there, parked outside little cafes, would be the same bikes we had, but immaculate and shiny, with riders that would have had a heart attack if the thing fell over. And by the looks of them, probably had another heart attack if they tried to pick it back up. And we would just refill our water bottles and head back into the unknown, off to fix flat tires and crash into things and camp under the stars, while they just sipped on their lattes and discussed the new season's colour schemes available on their 800 pound Gore-Tex jackets. That's bone. And then back in the UK, when we would go out on the narrow green lanes around England and Wales on our medium-sized bikes, we would occasionally meet the latte guys who had ventured off-road, but had really picked terrain that is starting to move away from stuff that huge adventure bikes are suitable for. 80 miles an hour across Africa, on gravel, dodging rhinos, they're perfect. Riding up wet Welsh single lane tracks on something that weighs the same as a rhino, they're less than ideal. So despite what I'm running around on here, my opinion on huge adventure bikes was that they have their place, but it's not outside Costa Coffee, which is where you see most of them, nor is it struggling through English fields, which is where you sometimes see a couple more. 
Basically, for most people, they're about as appropriate as a fully loaded X5 is for driving your kid half a mile to school, or then pretending it's a Jeep Wrangler and going out and destroying the countryside at the weekend. They're big, they're expensive, they're loaded with gadgets and toys, and that's why people buy them, even though they could cross continents if they wanted to. So why did I buy one a couple of weeks ago and what do I think of it now? First, park run, 10 minutes to go. Okay, I'm here. I've biked to a park run, that's a first. Uh, they're just getting ready. About two minutes to go, I think. I, I feel ready. I've got my uh, Apple Ultra watch with a rugged green strap on. I have a, the strap I have on the watch is green. That might be a better way of saying that. Um, I've got it set up really quite cool as well. I'll talk about it back in the office, but um, I've got it set so that it flashes pink if I'm going too slow, if I'm green, if I'm going fast enough, based on a pace that I've input already. Uh, very cool indeed. Uh, pink, nothing wrong with pink. I'm just using it here to indicate not fast enough. Um, 4.10 pace gives me a just under 21 minute park run. I haven't done a fast park run in months and months and months, so 21 might be optimistic, especially as I'm still obviously back into rehabbing this calf injury and yeah we'll see oh and got my glasses back um do you remember they fell in the pond that's cool ah! some guy found them one himself a built for athletes backpack for the person that rescues my oakleys but he didn't want any publicity he wanted to be very low key so uh, you don't get to see the official uh, sort of prisoner exchange of the backpack for the for the glasses. I don't know why you want to be low key. Didn't want to be known as the, the maiden head fountain splasher, I don't know, up to him. Anyway, I'm just happy. Got him back, see where I'm going today. Okay, start line. Woodley Park Run is not the place to go if you're reasonably quick, but not really quick. It's very demoralizing because despite having a 5K PB just over 19 minutes, I still get left at the start by over 20 people. It just seems to attract fast folk. Anyway, the Apple Watch, complete with its green strap on, and running the Work Outdoors app that I'd reviewed in my last video. It is perfect off the start line. Nice, big, easy start button, bold and green, hit that and go. And as I mentioned, I'd gone into the settings of the Work Outdoors app and set the pace for running to a target of four minutes, 10 per kilometer with pink and green target colors. I then set up one of the display screens to show average pace and total time, but more prominently, how far ahead or behind I was in seconds and distance compared to a virtual person running at the target pace. In the demo you'll be seeing on screen, because the watch is not actually moving, you'll just see those pink numbers getting worse and worse. Obviously, if I was moving at the right pace, they'd be green. And I found it really quite cool to have the occasional glance at the watch and see green, I'm ahead, it let me visualize the idea of being 30 or 40 meters up on somebody behind me. And I had an okay run. My calf felt a little bit tight towards the end, but no real big deal. The real issue was that my fitness is just simply down at the moment from not having trained enough. And I've not run a quick 5K in a while, but I hold roughly onto that pace, which is the right side of it, for the whole thing. Coming into the last kilometer, I was around 50 meters ahead of where I needed to be. Woodley's a three lap course, so you have to negotiate past the general public and their dogs and other slower runners that you're gonna be lapping and plenty of ducks everywhere. Not quite a full on sprint finish, but fast enough to hold off anybody wanting to come past. A little cheeky side glance to check for shadows of people coming up behind me, and I'm across the line. Is that one gonna scan? It does, that one scans better than the others. Yeah, for Apple Watch. So I think, the official park run time is going to be just the wrong side of 21. Uh, I had on my watch 21.09 when I stopped it. But looking at the stats on Work Outdoors, had me down for having run 5.12k at a pace of 4.08. So it basically thinks I ran a bit further. I'm going to take, because there's a donut on the line, uh, billions of pounds worth of satellite technology and Apple R&D over with the greatest respect, a park run marshal weaving around dog mess and ducks. And as I head off for that donut, I can confirm the Apple Watch was really very good. All the data I wanted, it synced up nicely with Strava afterwards. The only two things that would have made it perfect 
are the ability for the screen to stay on permanently rather than having to tilt your wrist and then wait a second or so for it to fire up, but apparently that is in the works. And also for the ability to use the physical action button on this thing to actually start and stop the race. Having to push the big green start button is fine at the beginning, but when you're running across the line at the end, a simple button is just a million times easier than having to push and hold the screen to bring up the end screen and then hit the end button. Sweaty hands, rushing across the line doesn't work. Hopefully, they're gonna be making that action button available to third party apps soon. Do you know, I told myself I would never have one of these for sports, but if they fix those couple of things, for my use, it might actually be perfect. Now, back to why I got that stupid bike. So I got my GPZ this summer, a blast from the past. She'll go out a couple of times a year, but pretty much lives here, which meant I had the experience of riding a bike for a week and then knowing I wouldn't ride again for months, which is weird. It's like having a Burger King a year. You're either someone that goes to Burger King or you're not. You don't go and then go without for ages. That's insane. So I thought what I need is a small, simple, cheap bike that I can just whiz about on day to day to sort of scratch the itch. I don't need it, it would just be cool to have one so that if I do want to go somewhere and the weather's really good, I could take the bike. Or maybe it's just a lovely sunny afternoon, I just feel like going for a ride. I really, I just wanted a toy. So, decision to make. I didn't want a sports bike, never used to like riding my R1 on the road, certainly wouldn't want to ride a modern fast sports bike anywhere other than a racetrack. So I thought, okay, I've got the Top Gun bike, I'll get the officer and a gentleman bike as well. A new Triumph Bonneville. A test road one, I loved it. It was quick, but not stupid fast. Comfortable, fun, looks great. But it turns out I'm a bit bigger than Richard Gear, and I was ridiculous sat on it. It literally did look like a toy. So now I had a problem. I was hooked on the idea of getting a bike, but for the first time ever, it didn't have a real purpose. So I didn't know what to get. My first bikes were, they were just my transport. My R1 was for tracks. The Husqvarna I had was for riding into snowdrifts. How I looked on those was not a real concern, but I was now bothered how I looked and subconsciously on the path towards fancy coffee and Gore-Tex jackets. Some people said, test a GS. I said, that is not happening. And so I test rode a lot of other bikes. Some highlights, uh, Triumph Scrambler, rode like a 1980 Scrambler. Harley Fat Bob gave me a bad back, although it did make me feel like Dolph Lundgren in The Punisher, so I very nearly bought it. Uh, Kawasaki H2, bonkers quick, but stupid for the road. Ducati Super Motard, nowhere near as much fun as it thinks it is. Uh, and the list went on. If this seems like a very weird mix of bikes as well, it's because basically I was just kind of clutching at straws in a desperate attempt to avoid going anywhere near a BMW dealership. And then a friend of mine who actually races bikes, but uses a GS Adventure on the road said, you really should just try one. I thought, well, a test ride can't hurt. I then knew two minutes into the test ride, I was buying one. The BMW GS, much like the BMW X series of cars, is simply really, really good at everything. And the fact that they're mostly used for going to Starbucks or blocking the roads at school leaving time doesn't change that. Despite my size and weight, it is super comfortable. It doesn't feel like a big bike to me at all. I can sit at motorway speeds with hardly any wind buffeting. The riding position means that you can just go all day long. You're sat upright, great visibility over traffic. My mum would love it. You can still chuck it about on twisty roads. In fact, on the twisties, it felt like I thought the Ducati Supermotar was supposed to feel. It's just a laugh. It's plenty fast enough. I mean, it's a fast bike. And the toys are cool. I'm taking it on a trip tomorrow. That's a couple of hours long. I'm gonna be getting some extra bits and pieces fitted to it. I'll be sat on the motorway for a lot of it. Heated grips on, heated seat on, listening to my music, cruise control. Sometimes toys just make sense. And it looks like a tank. I mean, it's kind of grown on me. It's black with the black boxes on it. It's got a kind of ugly G-Shock of a bike look. Even my kids were impressed. They said, it's massive and cool. Who doesn't want to hear that? Obviously, for your kids, it would be weird sometimes. It just does have a sort of kind of upmarket Mad Max kind of feel about it. On the road, I imagine seeing guys in full leathers on sports bikes looking at me and thinking, there's one of those dumb GS riders. But now I find myself looking at them with their unmarked knee sliders and nowhere to store their wallet. And I'm thinking, what do you look like? Obviously, there are all sorts of bikes that will do something better than the GS can do, but they won't do everything else it can do. I can load it with luggage, Jane can jump on the back, I can't even tell she's on there, we could ride to the south of France, or I can blast across town with my trainers and go for a jog, or just whiz around on a Sunday and just enjoy riding a motorbike. Sure, fully loaded up, it isn't filtering through traffic like a small bike, but it's still a bike, there is always a way to the front somewhere, and it is a stupidly expensive lump to take off-road, in fact I wouldn't take it anywhere remote really, it's just far too many complicated bits of something to go wrong. 
but for getting coffee or donuts, it might actually be perfect. I mean, it's just, it's just meant to be, isn't it? Okay, the park run time was officially 21.05, but that is good enough for a donut. Uh, Jen hasn't trained today, so Jen gets half a donut. No. <laughs> I'm gonna eat my donuts.